My name's Lee Greenwood. I run the Don't Move Firewood campaign for the Nature Conservancy, and I also run the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative, which is an um, informational group that I run in order to make sure that all the different diverse stakeholders that deal with firewood um, on an the North American level have some sort of forum in which to communicate with one another about all the different regulations. Now every January I go through every single re regulation and recommendation uh, regarding firewood in all of North America and I do my darndest to summarize all of them on the Don't Move Firewood map. And this year I thought it would be really helpful to everybody to get a really firm grip on the diversity of regulations that apply to firewood, so this is my attempt to do that. Um, now, the one uh, I was talking to one of my coworkers recently about this webinar and um, kind of chit-chatting about it, and I said, you know, oh, and then there's the um, regulation on Ohia wood. That's an interesting one. And they said, what on earth is Ohia? And I think that really kind of um, encapsulated the whole beauty of the need for this webinar, which is that um, not everybody is familiar with the native trees of Hawaii and how you're actually not allowed to move ohia wood from island to island to try to limit the spread of the um, invasive disease that's affecting that canopy tree. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a form of a quarantine. So with that in mind, I'm going to get started. Before we get totally into the depth of regulations, I just wanted to clarify a couple pieces of vocabulary for anybody who maybe doesn't work with this stuff every day. So number one, quarantine. I'll be using that term all the time during this webinar. There's two types of quarantines that are important to the world of firewood. One is an external quarantine, and that is a limit on things that enter an area. So it's to keep things out of a defined area. Then there's an internal quarantine which sometimes people just call quarantines, which is why the vocabulary is a little confusing. And that is to keep some sort of a threat inside a limited area to protect the areas away from the pest. So both of those things are going to come into play in this webinar. Okay, uh, then the next piece of vocabulary I wanna make sure we all understand is a regulated item. Now a regulated item is just something and it can be anything, truly, that can serve as a carrier for whatever problem is being regulated. So if we're talking about aquatic invasives, a regulated item could literally be water in a bucket. We're going to be talking about firewood. And with firewood, it is commonly regulation for forest pests as well as other pests, but it is not the only regulated item for any of the regulated pests that we'll be talking about. And also, it's important to know that the only way to take a regulated item across a quarantine boundary is to have some sort of situation applied to it, whether that's an appropriate treatment, an inspection, a certification, something. Otherwise, you're not supposed to take it across the quarantine. That's the nature of the quarantine. Okay, so now we know what regulated items are. And last but not least, this amazing chart, which is really overwhelming, and I'm sorry, but the core of it is that there are three types of heat treatments that are commonly applied to items that pertain to firewood movement. Um, in the middle, roughly, of your slide uh, is the um, treatment manual code, which you can find on the 2012 PPQ manual, if you look that up. And there's A, B, and C. I have them out of order because I ordered them from coolest to hottest, if you look at the temperatures on the far left. Now, each one of these types of treatments could be applied to different things, and I added some definition of what exactly is applied, um, what exactly each treatment is applied to right now, to the very best of my knowledge. This is definitely an incomplete list, but it helps you understand that there's actually multiple different treatment levels for multiple different types of goods depending greatly on the biology of the particular item and also the physical qualities of it. So thicker versus thinner, hardwood versus softwood, et cetera. Now one thing in the past is I've shown this chart and I actually had an error on it. I'm very sorry about that. Um, in the past, I had Asian longhorn beetle reclassified up into um, 314A. And that is because of this confusion that resulted from the 2014 rule process. Now I have a little note on the bottom there, I'm not gonna get into it. That's where the mistake came from. 
and we're going to move forward with it. Now we know that Asian longhorn beetle remained in 314C despite confusion. Okay, now we're going to get into the meat of the matter. These are all the different types of regulations that you can kind of wrangle into different categories. Now, in the process of making this PowerPoint, I realized that going through the regulations state by state would essentially make us all go blind. It's absolutely miserable to do it that way. So instead, what makes a lot more sense is to go through the regulations in conceptual categories so that you understand what each one, how they all interact with one another. The three biggest conceptual categories that made sense to me as I built this PowerPoint were pest-driven regulations, spatially drawn regulations, and distance from origin regulations. And then within each of those groups, there are one, two, or four subcategories that I'm going to use in order to make sense of this very uh, broad scope of different types of regulations. So we're going to start with pest-driven regulations. Oh, before I finish, if you had to call into the webinar and so you're unable to use the chat box, I would love to know that you're on this webinar. If you could please email me and just say, hi, my name is whatever and your agency, that would really help me understand how many people attended this webinar. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. And my email will be listed at the end of the webinar in case you don't have it. So, okay, pest-driven regulations. The federally regulated pests that have pest-driven regulations where firewood is a regulated item are listed on this page. So you'll see that there are seven of them that I am aware of. It is possible in any of these slides that I have made errors, and so please keep that in mind. But firewood is, to the best of my knowledge, a legitimately regulated item in some fashion for all seven of these. Now you'll notice right off the bat that two of them are really not considered to be forest pests. That's just giant African snail and red imported fire ant. Um, I'm talking about firewood today. Normally I really focus on forests and trees, but today we're just doing firewood. And when you talk about these two pests, giant African snail and red imported fire ant, both of them have quarantines that deal with things like yard waste, which firewood could be considered. That's giant African snail. Or things that are in direct contact with the dirt that fire ants could enter and nest in. That's red imported fire ant, of course. And so in both of those cases, regulated items could include firewood. And in fact, the biology of those particular invasive species would probably support the inclusion of firewood in the regulated items. So we're going to go through the pests uh, fairly rapidly, one at a time. I accidentally made this particular slide hilariously out of scale. So I just wanted to make it clear that the Ohio Asian longhorn beetle quarantine area is 61 square miles. Um, the New York quarantine area is 137 square miles when you take the two red blotches put together. So you can see like the New York one looks smaller on this map, but actually it's way bigger. Um, and then Massachusetts is a lot smaller than New York State, uh, which is pretty funny. And um, that is in between sizes. It's 110 square miles. But you can see that the regulated areas for um, firewood moving out of these particular pest infestations are tiny with respect to the states. I mean, maybe not so tiny with respect to Massachusetts, but generally speaking, these are not huge swaths um, of areas where firewood movement cannot be moved out of the area. So that's Asian longhorn beetle. Now, talk about huge swaths. The cooperative emerald ash or federal EAB quarantine area is giant. And even though in any given one of these yellow counties, you may only have very limited or even no occurrence of emerald ash borer, depending on the precise location and the history and so forth, you are not allowed to move hardwood firewood out of essentially the red line macro barrier here. So nothing's allowed out. So for instance, if you're in southern Arkansas, in that big blob, you cannot move firewood to northern Arkansas, nor could you move it into Oklahoma or Texas out of that a directly adjacent blob. Now what's interesting about the emerald ash borer quarantine is that in the federal rules, it does not mean that you can't move it within the yellow zone. So you actually could transport firewood in the yellow zone, 
legally speaking, by the rules of the federal quarantine. Now, some states have additional rules, and we'll get to that. But generally speaking, you can't take firewood from the yellow zone to the white zone at all, unless there's appropriate heat treatment. European gypsy moth is extremely similar with a totally different color coding scheme. Anything that is um, brightly colored is under quarantine, and you cannot take firewood out of that zone and into the other zones. So if we just look at Ohio, you've got a bunch of, uh, let's see, red zones, purple, blue. You cannot take things out of those different colors and into the um, kind of cream colored part of Ohio. Similarly, it is against the rule to take firewood from Virginia down into North Carolina um, into the cream colored area. Uh, but you could take firewood from Virginia north because um, inside that region is not part of the limitation of the movement of firewood. If anybody, by the way, is on this webinar and has a question and can use the chat, I have the chat box open, or if you know I'm saying something wrong, I really would love to be corrected in real time because I am recording this webinar. So please go ahead, use the chat box. You can either send it to everyone or you can send it to my uh, my alias today, which is Whitney Polanski. I'm borrowing her WebEx account. She's my coworker. Um, and so we'll send it to Whitney Polanski if you need it to reach me. Okay, so we talked about giant African snail. This is a less known pest that can um, use firewood as a, um, basically like a hibernacula during hot weather, or it can just have when the snails are very small and immature, they can just be using firewood as part of its natural environment and, and so forth. Um, it only currently is found in a really fairly discreet zone down on that southern tip of Florida. Um, that box might not be entirely accurate. I kind of had to eyeball it. Uh, but that's only the, the only place in North America that it's found right now. It's also completely infested um, Hawaii, but because it's all of Hawaii, I didn't include a map because it's all of Hawaii. So firewood um, may be possibly one of the regulated items covered by the yard waste inclusion of the regulated item listing for giant African snail. I was not able to verify that 100%. I simply couldn't find the document um, in time for this webinar, but I'm fairly certain that the spirit of yard waste would include firewood. Pine shoot beetle is a underappreciated pest. Um, any kind of pine wood with bark on is included in the quarantine for pine shoot beetle. Now you may notice that this map really closely resembles much of the gypsy moth map and the older infestation uh, area of emerald ash borer. So that might be a part of why people don't tend to remember that articles cannot, regulated articles of pine cannot be removed from the pine shoot beetle quarantine area, but that is in fact the law. And so this is also a limit on the movement of firewood from the red or pink zone uh, outward into the cream or um, let's see, in Canada that's kind of a gray color. Then we get to imported fire ants. Now it sounds like I'm being crazy and saying like who would pick up firewood that is infested with imported fire ant because you'd immediately get bitten by ants. Well, not if the ants are cold and it's early in the morning or if you're picking it up with machinery and so it's not really obvious that because, you know, the forklift is protecting you from the ants or whatever. So any kind of firewood that is being stored in direct contact with bare earth, so dirt, um, on the ground could potentially have imported fire ant queens entering and nesting in the firewood. And so that becomes a regulated article. You can see there is a disjunct aspect to the quarantine. There's a little section of Orange County, California, and some little spot infestations that um, are included in this quarantine. But the vast majority of the current imported fire ant quarantine is in the southeastern United States. And you can't take firewood that's been stored on the ground in this area north up out of those quarantine areas legally. Um, you could do it. It's just not a good idea because you would be violating a federal quarantine. Further, 
P. remorum, also known as sudden oak death, has a firewood aspect to its regulated items. It's very specific in terms of species, and the quarantine itself is only really found in Northern California and a strange little piece of Oregon. But um, for those particular species of cut wood, you're not allowed to remove them, firewood or not, from the sudden oak death P. remorum quarantine area. So again, smaller area, but still important to know that those regulations do exist and they are on the books. Okay, so that makes it through all the different federal regulated pests administered by USDA APHIS that have firewood as a um, stated explicitly or um, within the spirit of the regulated items list. Now, we're going to get into the pests of concern that are not actually federally regulated by U.S. authorities. And don't worry, we're going to get to Canada later. Uh, that is four different pests, of which three of them are distinct pests, and one is uh, um, insect fungal complex, which is thousand cankers disease. So sometimes you'll hear thousand cankers disease being referred to as um, walnut twig beetles. I'm just going to be consistent and call it thousand cankers disease for the sake of the PowerPoint. Mountain pine beetle is a native pest of pine. Um, I live in Montana in that big blotchy red zone, that's me. And uh, we just deal with mountain pine beetle as it comes and goes. It's very problematic, but it is a native pest. However, uh, in the eastern areas of Canada and the United States, people are extremely concerned about how this particular pest could become a functional invasive species as it moves across either the Jack Pine Northern Highway, which is that upper arcing arrow, um, which it has never done in the past, or across the plains in commercial goods or personal firewood. And as a result of those concerns, there are two regulations that, are, um, that exist that I know of, one of which is that Minnesota has an external quarantine on pine goods from infested areas that still have their bark on them, so that still could be bearing um, mountain pine beetle. And then also, I don't really have a great grasp on how it works, but there is some sort of a regulation between Saskatchewan and Alberta to minimize the movement of pine across that big jack pine swath up in um, central northern Canada. So there is something there. Um, I actually didn't dig far enough into it to really be articulate about it, but there are regulations in place for both of those potential movements of firewood um, across North America out of the native range of mountain pine beetle into new and potentially invaded range. And of course, once mountain pine beetle gets into this contiguous pine forest of the east, it doesn't have to just stick to jack pine, which is what it's going to encounter first in the north. You know, it could move to all sorts of different susceptible pines. Um, and of course, there's a huge variety of pine trees in the eastern United States that could be susceptible. Now we're going to get to Ohia. Um, this is not a federally regulated uh, pest. It's rapid Ohia death, R-O-D, is the sort of shorthand term for this particular pest. But it's been moving throughout the island of Hawaii, thought to be a combination of natural movement and potentially yard waste and firewood movement. Um, and you can see that the colors of the dots change over time. It's moving farther and farther away from its point of infestation. And in fact, firewood is a regulated item. Not only are you not supposed to move firewood um, throughout the island of Hawaii to slow this down as much as possible, but also if you take a look at the map that I included on the bottom right, you'll notice that Hawaii is the biggest island and you are not allowed to take firewood um, to the other islands uh, to the west because they, uh, Ohia firewood, which is the name of the tree, you're not allowed to take the Ohia firewood out of that big island and over to the other islands um, because they don't want it to spread. And the ohia tree is a, a dominant canopy species that is native to the Hawaiian islands. So this will be really devastating if this completely destroys the ohia population. And that is not a federally regulated pest. Ooh, this did not upload very well. I'm sorry. So it's really hard to read this map, but the counties that have their names labeled on them are under quarantine by the state of Pennsylvania in order to limit the movement of goods out of that region because they could be contaminated with spotted lanternfly, uh, egg sacs, adults, whatever. And so those eastern, southeastern counties are currently under quarantine. This is not currently a federally regulated pest, although there's a lot of attention being paid to it. And you can't also move goods within there, but that's different from 
a um, internal quarantine. That's actually a movement limitations that they've put in place, which are separate. So uh, the vast majority of Pennsylvania is not under quarantine for this pest, and so you cannot take materials out of that southeastern zone into the other part. South and cankerous disease uh, is a really tricky one because it has a native or somewhat well-established long-term range where um, those are the uh, hash marks on the western half of the United States or western third of the United States. And then there's all of these states that are kind of orange-ish um, on the right-hand side. And some of those actually have infestation points, 4,000 cankerous disease, those are the ones that are hashed, so Ohio, Pennsylvania, et cetera, but they're also under quarantine for additional import of materials out of the western states. And then some of them don't have established 1,000 cankerous disease spot infestations, such as um, Nebraska and Minnesota. And um, in those cases, those states have quarantines without internal movement regulations either because they don't have spot infestations. So this is a complicated overlay of different quarantines. Now I'm going to get back to 1,000 cankerous disease because it provides an interesting illustration of how complicated these quarantines get. But each of these is um, a external quarantine so that, that any orange state does not permit the movement of 1,000 cankerous disease regulated items into its state from an infested state on the west. And then also the ones that have the hash marks on the far eastern side, so Virginia, et cetera. Those ones sometimes also have internal movement limits of firewood in order to minimize the amount of firewood that could be moved that could make their existing spot infestation of 1,000 cankerous disease even worse. So that's complicated stuff. Now, Chris Watson um, from Utah mentions that there is a balsam woolly adelgid quarantine in Michigan. I missed it. Balsam woolly adelgid is a pest that can be moved on firewood within sort of regular scientific thought because it does um, get into the bark surfaces of um, balsam fir. And so that's a really good one. I will add that to uh, my future presentations. So thank you for catching that uh, omission, Chris. I had completely missed that one. OK. So then we get out of the pest-driven regulations, and uh, we are going to go into the spatially drawn regulations. Now, these are a whole other class. These are not necessarily pest-driven. And when you talk about spatially drawn regulations, the most obvious spatially drawn regulations are the international boundaries. Now, for instance, Canada and the United States, we share a pretty significant boundary, and you cannot move firewood into the United States from a source in Canada uh, without heat treating it to two separate heat treatment standards, um, 314A or 314B, depending on whether or not it is hardwood or softwood. And that is a regulation that is held by USDA APHIS, but then um, on the ground it is, a, it is um, actually executed by Customs and Border Protection. I apologize for all of the acronyms. These slides were already so wordy that I just put them in, even though it's bad practice. And then from, of course, Canada, from a source in the United States, so in reverse, things coming essentially north, unless you're in Alaska, in which case they're going east, then it would be um, Canadian Food Inspection Agency is regulating that material. Um, they use the universal heat treatment standard, which is 314B and their Canadian border some service agency, I don't remember that acronym off the top of my head, they, similar to our structure where they have a regulatory authority and then a border agency, they have the same system for theirs. Uh, likewise, there's a regulations on both personal and commercial movement of firewood across the Mexican border. I did not do a very good job of researching this one because I ran out of time, but I am aware that you cannot bring firewood from Mexico into the United States for personal use without at least a visual inspection, if not also some of it being rejected um, due to a lack of heat treatment. But to be totally frank, I didn't get all the way into that. Now, for other countries from overseas, there's also an extensive amount of regulations um, which are, again, held by USDA APHIS and then administered on the ground by Customs and Border Protection. Um, and when you see firewood from some crazy place, and the, the thing that everybody always sort of laughs about is the firewood that comes in from um, the Baltic states, the sort of former Soviet Union area, um, that firewood cannot enter without some sort of heat treatment 
or deparking or both or something. Um, and all of those regulations are ma managed by USDA APHIS because those are regulated items for all sorts of international movement regulations held by APHIS. So that firewood, even if it doesn't appear to be treated or is not labeled as such in its you know, point of sale, it has been in some form. Then you get to the spatially drawn regulations of states trying to protect themselves. And these are crazy, frankly, because there are so many different types of them. So I broke them out into four different types in order to better understand the entire picture. So number one, there's comprehensive external quarantines, which means that the entire state limits all movement of firewood into it from any other state, um, either hardwood or softwood, to some sort of heat treatment standard. Um, and that includes the states that I have listed there, so Florida all the way through Wisconsin on that first bullet. Now, there's also states that have a non-comprehensive external quarantine or equivalent um, that has lots and lots of different types of quarantines um, and limits and species indicated and so forth. So sometimes that either creates a functional nearly external quarantine or it creates a situation where at least the amount of firewood coming into it is pretty tightly regulated. And I would say that the four states that fall into that kind of category are California, because um, California Food and Ag does um, a really comprehensive job of listing out all the places you cannot move firewood into California and put all together. It, it really does encompass nearly every point of origin in the United States. Um, Minnesota has two separate types of quarantines that limit the firewood that enters Minnesota. Um, they have a TCD, which is thousand cankers disease uh, quarantine, as well as a all hardwood quarantine, which is as a result of historical um, limitations on the movement from emerald ash borer. So to put together those two actually limit a huge amount of firewood from entering the state. Oregon has a non-comprehensive external quarantine because it has essentially a waiver for Mass uh, Massachusetts. That's funny for Washington State and Idaho, which are, of course, their adjacent states, um, there is no sort of equivalent waiver for California. Um, and so it's not really a comprehensive program. Firewood from the other states has to be heat treated in order to enter Oregon commercially or um, for personal firewood. But it does, put together, it doesn't quite make a full external quarantine. And then uh, Utah has just enacted a external quarantine um, for any kind of area of concern, but not all areas are of concern. So it's not a comprehensive external quarantine. It is, it encompasses huge parts of the United States, but not every single state is applied to that Utah quarantine. So that's non-comprehensive. Then you get into the thousand cankers disease um, map. There's two different approaches that the states have taken towards thousand cankers disease in terms of putting up external quarantines. And those include external quarantines of all hardwood firewood because it's really hard to tell firewood apart once it's in a commercial load between different species of trees if they're all hardwood trees. And that's that first list of TCD origin only from Indiana all the way through Wisconsin. And then there's a couple states that took a totally different tack and said only walnut species, that's Juglans spot there, only walnut species firewood cannot enter their state from a known state that has thousand cankers disease living in it. So that's a really different approach because it's really hard to um, say whether or not a single piece of firewood or a full load of firewood contains any walnut firewood in it. But that is the approach that five states took in order to limit the movement of firewood that potentially is a carrier of thousand cankers disease into those states. So those are the four types of individual state border quarantines that currently exist to the best of my knowledge in North America. Now, I should again give the um, statement that I could be making mistakes here. These could be wrong. Sometimes these quarantines get lifted and I'm not aware of it. Sometimes new quarantines get put into place and I'm not aware of it. We do a really, really comprehensive and I think excellent job of trying to figure this all out. Mistakes sneak in and things change. Then you get into the spatially drawn regulations of land owning entities that are federal, not state. Uh, and um, those are really diverse. So you have national parks, um, which a lot of national parks in the greater region of the um, Great Lakes and sort of central, central eastern Atlantic forests 
kind of area um, has national park regulations saying that absolutely no, these are the ones I listed here, I believe, are the ones that say that no firewood that hasn't been treated is allowed to enter their parks. Then there's, of course, other, excuse me, um, parks that have rules that say firewood from a certain distance can't enter their parks, but I did not include those because those are much harder to sort of wrap your brain around. So those are some of the national parks that say absolutely no firewood that has not been certified as heat treated and is labeled and packaged can enter our park. Then you have national forests that have the same rules. Now these particular national forests are again from the Great Lakes and sort of central um, Atlantic forest kind of area. And when I say that, I mean kind of like um, Tennessee and Kentucky and all that. That's generally speaking where these all occur. And those are not allowed to, um, firewood is not allowed to enter into those national forests uh, from, unless it's been certified as heat treated. Now, um, there's also entire Army Corps of Engineers sites, which of course the Army Corps of Engineers manage a huge network of campgrounds throughout their regions because everybody loves to recreate near water and they are in charge of things like dams. So, um, you know, the Nashville district has a uh, millions of people visiting it per year because that's in the same general region as, for instance, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. St. Paul district is up to the west of the Great Lakes, and um, that has you know a ton of lakes and rivers and so forth. So none of the campgrounds within those two Army Corps of Engineers districts permit the entrance of anything but heat-treated, regulated, uh, heat-treated certified firewood. I may not have a full list of the districts. Army Corps of Engineers um, has put some of these rules into effect fairly recently, but I assure you these two districts are accurate. Interestingly, the Bureau of Land Management does not have any regulations that I have been able to find for the movement of firewood. And I believe that is mostly because uh, the Bureau of Land Management almost entirely manages dispersed camping. And so there would be absolutely no one to tell you not to bring in firewood. And so I wonder if that's why they do not have any regulations that I've ever been able to find. They do have some great educational materials, so that's a good thing. Another main, uh, large land-owning entity category that regulates firewood is state park entities. Now, it's, this is tricky because each state park is either each state park group is either run by itself in some cases, or sometimes they have a separate state agency that runs them. Every state is different. So for instance, in Montana, it's Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And so that agency runs their parks. But um, I think it's Michigan. So like Michigan DNR administers the state lands, which are their state parks. It, it seems very complicated. Every single state is different. It's probably not complicated if you're actually in that state, because that's what you're used to. But these are examples of state parks that have regulations stating that you cannot bring firewood into them or that there is a legal limit to the type of firewood that can enter them. So in California, some of the southern state parks especially have a rule that no oak firewood is allowed to enter them and that um, rule is uh, motivated by the presence of gold spotted oak borer and its devastation on mature oaks throughout so southern California. Kentucky State Parks has a certified firewood only rule so if it's not packaged, heat treated and labeled, you can't bring it in. Michigan State Lands has a certified um, and labeled rule unless it's been completely debarked, which I find fascinating. But that is kind of a nice concession to folks that really want to bring in their own firewood and are paying attention to the rule. And that does, of course, greatly minimize risk, even though it does not eliminate risk. Tennessee State Parks also only permits certified heat-treated firewood, much like Kentucky State Parks. Wisconsin State Parks allows certified heat-treated firewood, or you can source it from within 10 miles of the park. I don't know how they enforce that. Um, Wisconsin has always been a leader in firewood regulation and proactive thinking, so I assume they have some sort of system for that. I'm just not aware of. Vermont State Parks have kind of a similar rule, which is you're only allowed to have certified heat-treated firewood, or you have to have harvested it in Vermont. And Virginia State Parks uh, doesn't have a rule that I was able to find on the books, but it um, says in fairly significant terms all over their website, they're going to confiscate any untreated firewood if you're coming in from an emerald ash borer infested county. So they must have some sort of raw rule on the books in order to be able to confiscate personal property upon entrance to the park. So I assume there's some kind of a regulation that provides the backbone for that particular 
um, regulation. Then there's a couple places in the United States that have what I sort of created a catch-all um, term for, which is a less than a state-sized geographic boundary that limits the movement of firewood. So um, in Connecticut, Iowa, and Wisconsin, you cannot move firewood between emerald ash borer infested counties and un within the same state and uninfested counties according to the laws of those states. Um, so they have additional laws on top of the current federal laws in order to minimize the movement of potentially infested materials within their state. That's very similar to the system that I just mentioned in Hawaii where you cannot move ohia, wood or waste or anything in between the islands in order to um, minimize the movement of the serostis wilt, which is also called rapid ohia death. Likewise, Michigan, for a very long time now, has um, limited the movement of firewood from the lower peninsula, which is the part kind of under the lakes, to the upper peninsula, which is the part wedged in between two lakes, um, because the lower peninsula was generally infested and the upper peninsula for a while was uninfested and then now is only very spot infested. And so they're trying to limit how much ash is killed uh, up in that upper peninsula area. And so they have a limit within their state of a less than um, state uh, boundary. Now, John Bedford is helping me out here and he says that uh, the current Michigan state land firewood regulations only involve ash firewood. So that's a very specific regulation, and it gets into that problem where, um, you know, how do you tell a mixed load of firewood from an ash load of firewood and so on. So, John, that's really great. Thank you for the, the live time correction on that one. I also did see that I made a um, typo on a prior slide that I listed Illinois in two different types of quarantines. Sorry about that. I will look into which one is actually accurate um, after this webinar is completed. Then um, the last thing that I found really fascinating in the process of uh, researching for this webinar is the Wyoming Weed and Pest Control Act actually permits the listing of forest pests. Um, that's a completely unacceptable pest under the Pest Control Act. And in fact, Park County, which is very lightly outlined in the northwest corner of this um, map, it didn't quite translate perfectly, um, which is uh, about half of Yellowstone National Park has preemptively listed emerald ash borer on their Weed and Pest Control Act list for their county to allow for preparation and potentially action at the time when emerald ash borer is found in the city of Powell, which uh, you can't tell on this map, but that's the city that's on the northeastern corner of Park County. It's the biggest um, and most ash-covered ash city in the county. Um, I think this is a really interesting proactive move because um, Yellowstone receives 4.25 million visitors plus every year. Uh, the 2017 statistics are not yet prepared. And so the number of people camping in and near Powell, that city, that could potentially be coming in from infested areas to the east or um, Boulder County, Colorado, is really significant. Now, they don't currently have a firewood regulation, so this is a little bit non-parallel to the rest of my presentation, but because they have already listed emerald ash borer as a pest of concern in their pest and control list for Park County, they could prohibit the movement of firewood into their county when they're ready. So um, that control county by county that we see in Connecticut, Iowa, and Wisconsin, it also could potentially be applied to any of the big western states or any state that has um, a county weed control type structure. And when I spoke with some of my colleagues in Montana and North Dakota yesterday to do some fact checking, I did determine that in fact, Montana, South Dakota, and North Dakota certainly should have the same capability to control the movement of firewood county by county. Certainly, it absolutely could be other states. I just didn't have the time to figure it out. So many big Western states probably have this ability. So I find that really interesting. All right, so the last large category um, that you can use to better understand the diverse different uh, regulations that can be applied to firewood is the distance from Oregon regulation, <laughs> distance from origin regulation, also the distance from Oregon, but that's okay. Uh, so for a distance from origin regulation, there's really only three states that use this um, legally for their whole state, and that's New York, 
has a rule inside the state of New York that you can't move firewood more than 50 miles um, and you have to have a piece of paper that basically self-certifies you as doing as moving firewood within 50 miles. Um, so that is a distance limitation in New York, and that applies to all firewood. Florida has this 50-mile grace zone to its north where you're not allowed to bring non-heat-treated um, firewood into the state of Florida, but if you're within 50 miles in that grace zone, you actually kind of get a free pass. So that's a distance-based uh, regulation. And then Oregon has this proximity-based, which I kind of figure um, includes the same concept. And firewood in Oregon, um, firewood from Washington and Idaho can be moved into Oregon without heat treatment because they are adjacent and they've determined that it provides, that those states present very low risk for um, the movement of firewood at this time. Now, of course, they could change that at any time if there was an issue that they were concerned about in Washington and Idaho, but that's essentially a distance-based regulation as well. And then, as I mentioned in a prior slide, um, there are two state parks that I am aware of that also have a distance-based regulation, um, Wisconsin, Wisconsin State Parks and Vermont State Parks. So those also kind of fit into two different categories in my conceptual framework of all the different firewood regulations. So what about Canada? Well, Canada can basically be divided up into the same conceptual groups as uh, the United States. And so um, because I was really worried that I was going to run out of time for this entire presentation, uh, having never given it before, I did not get really deep into Canada. But what we do know is that there are additional Canadian pests with quarantine regions that include firewood as their regulated items. And those three pests are brown spruce longhorn beetle, Dutch elm disease, and hemlock woolly adelgid. Now, this is really different from the United States. First of all, brown spruce longhorn beetle does not occur in the United States. And so that particular pest, which is isolated in North, uh, well, I guess to Canada, southeastern Canada, um, southeastern Canada, um, that is one that we're not familiar with. And that, of course, affects spruce trees. Um, Dutch elm disease, we often think of as kind of a pest of the past, but Western Canada does not think about that as a pest of the past. And in fact, they have regulations limiting the movement of materials to protect cities in the western part of Canada that have never had Dutch elm disease and hopefully never will because of all of the advancements in control technology that we've had in the last few decades. So Dutch elm disease is actually quite tightly regulated, in my opinion, in Canada to prevent the movement of that material, which includes, of course, firewood. Interestingly, the um, hemlock woolly adelgid is regulated with, uh, firewood is regulated as a regulated item with hemlock woolly adelgid in Canada. That's different than in the United States. Oftentimes, um, hemlock woolly adelgid explicitly doesn't include firewood as a regulated item in the United States because the chance of it moving on firewood because of the biology, the sort of microhabitat preferences of hemlock woolly adelgid is really pretty low. And I don't know why uh, the Canadian system regulates firewood and the U.S doesn't. But that's a really interesting difference to me. Those regulations are different. And right now, the regulations for hemlock woolly adelgid in Canada explicitly include the movement of firewood. In terms of the international boundaries, obviously, this is parallel to the U.S. system. And I already kind of went through how there's differences between hardwood and softwood moving across the boundary. Um, so I'm not going to rehash all of that. There is some interesting individual provincial laws that apply within Canadian provinces, um, specifically Saskatchewan and Alberta um, have a interprovincial agreement on the books to minimize the movement of um, the vectors of Dutch elm disease, so basically anything that could be carrying it, including firewood. And then another pest that I am blanking on, because this has been a long webinar, I think it's mountain pine beetle. Um, and so what they're doing is essentially they're saying that, you know, we're, we're out in the plains, we're this huge geographical limit on firewood, and so they have these um, disposal bins, actually, to get rid of potentially contaminated items on the, you know, major intersection points between Saskatchewan and Alberta to prevent the movement of regulated items over those provincial borders. Um, so that is very similar to some of the systems that we have. Um, although, of course, different paths, different uh, provinces. So then you get into landowning entities. There are two parks in Nova Scotia with amazingly awesome names that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. 
that limits the movement of firewood in and out of them, as I understand it, because they have brown spruce longhorn beetle, and one of them also has hemlock woolly adelgid. I believe it's the second one. Um, and so they are trying to uh, both reduce the chance of additional pests entering the park and uh, prevent them from being the source population for firewood moving out of the park and potentially infesting another area. So they have regulations on the entrance of firewood. And then Bruce Peninsula, which is in the Great Lakes area in Ontario, southern Ontario, right on the lakes, um, does not permit the entrance of firewood into its park. That is absolutely because they're trying to manage their um, ash tree resource and they um, explicitly say, you know, the, the emerald ash borer has hit this area really hard and we're trying to preserve our natural beauty. So that's Bruce Peninsula. Um, I did not find any less than province size geographic boundaries that apply to firewood. So for instance, no particular city um, or uh, I don't even know if provinces have counties or something like that with a different name, um, but I wasn't able to find anything like that. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, they don't have any small geographic boundaries um, that regulate the movement of firewood. And then also I did not find any distance from Oregon origin regulations. There is a very commonly stated 80 kilometer recommendation, very similar to the fact that oftentimes in the United States you'll find a 50 mile recommendation, but that is not a regulation. And we're, so I'm not gonna cover it for the sake of this PowerPoint. So in summary, Across North America, the complexity of this regulatory environment is really significant. Talking at a probably nearly incomprehensible speed, it took me 47 minutes to get through a very superficial summary of every single regulation that I'm aware of. Um, and when you look at them in the groups that I created in order to make some sense out of this complexity, you see that this is really a, a very very tricky environment for any kind of movement of firewood, whether it's personal firewood or the firewood industry or distribution networks or um, anyone. It's, it's really a lot. And um, when you look at pest-driven regulations, there are 14 different pests, uh, 15, because I missed Baltimore Delgid, um, that are either a federal U.S., Canadian federal, or a pest of concern that has regulations regarding it. Um, in North America, not even counting Mexico, I was not able to dig into Mexican regulations for the sake of this PowerPoint. Uh, furthermore, you know, there's three different categories of international boundaries, so the shared border between Canada and the U.S., shared border between the U.S. and Mexico, and the import of overseas materials, um, and they each have their own sets of regulations, and people who especially are driving across the border can often run afoul. One of the top things, because I live in the state of Montana, that I hear when somebody asks me, oh, what do you do for a living? And I kind of explain it. They say, oh, that's why they took all my firewood when I was trying to go to Banff. I'm like, yes, that's exactly why they took all your firewood when you were trying to get to Banff. People just have no idea that that regulation exists at the border between U.S. and Canada. And then in terms of the individual state borders, that one is a real doozy. Remember, there's four different types of external quarantines as I... Um, sort of categorized them and they cover 24 different states and some states have two different types. And then there are the two provinces in Canada that also have a state, well, in that case, a province based regulation in order to limit the movement of firewood and protect trees on either side of their provincial boundaries. Then in terms of the landowning entities, we have four different major entities in the United States and one in Canada, which is their national park system that all use the, um, boundaries of their entity in order to control the movement of firewood into their zone. So basically that would be an external quarantine. So protecting the resources within a park with the exception of the parks in Canada that have brown spruce longhorn beetle who are also trying to protect the resources outside of their parks. And then we have these less than state geographic boundary models. That was four different types of less than state geographic boundaries from, from counties to islands, it's a very complicated sort of smaller scale structure um, and those are pretty, uh, they're unusual, but they're also used in several places. So I feel like it's a, it's a good category to sort of catch all of those small geographic boundary models. Last but not least, we've got the distance from origin regulations, which not a lot of people engage in. Five states out of um, potentially, you know, all the different, I think it's 12 provinces and 50 states. So um, that's a pretty minor type of regulation, but definitely is out there.
And that gets us to our question slide. We've only got seven minutes left, uh, which is great because I did not go over time and I covered all the material I was hoping to cover. I wanted to take a moment to thank all of our partners, everyone who ever helps us fact check all of this stuff and it really takes a village to fact check this amount of um, regulatory information. And then special thanks to USDA APHIS. They are the predominant funders of both the Don't Move Firewood campaign and the FOSI initiative, Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative, um, which is what this webinar is, a, um, is for. Um, and uh, if you have any specific questions for me on regulatory borders, I would urge you to please give me a direct email. Um, the, uh, when I close this webinar, I believe I will not be able to access all the chat. So you can see my email right there. It is lgreenwood at tnc.org. Um, and I urge you to email me, and I will do my best to answer your question efficiently. Um, if anyone is on the phone but is not on the chat, if you could just send me a quick email with your name so that I have an, an, um, an accurate attendance record, that would be terribly helpful to me um, in terms of reporting out how successful these webinars are to our funding source. And um, if you have any questions, uh, I would urge you to put them in the chat box, but I am also going to turn off the mute all so that everyone can opt to actually try to talk to me over the phone. I'm going to unmute all, and when I do that, there's probably going to be background noise, and if it's terrible, I'm going to mute you all again. Day, day to day. Um, okay, so everyone, I can hear you talking. Ideas, but they don't implement it, so they meet once or twice a year, four times. Muting all. So, if anybody has a question, please put it in the chat box or email me. We have five minutes for questions. The first question I see is, um, is, which is privately sent to me, and it says, is there anything that covers eastern Kansas, Missouri border that I should be aware with with regards to movement or restricted prohibited movement of firewood? Thank you. You know, that's a tough one to answer off the top of my head. Um, Missouri and Kansas both have a number of different uh, regulations. I would be in particular on the alert for 1,000 cankerous disease regulations. Um, but if you email me privately, I will help you uh, look up the resources to get the actual legal answer because I am not a regulatory authority nor a lawyer. Um, so my advice should never be taken uh, to make business decisions. Does anybody else have a question they'd like to put into the chat box in the last four minutes of this PowerPoint webinar? I will be posting the recording on our YouTube channel and linking it to uh, the event listing that I have on the Don't Move Firewood webpage. If you have a colleague or friend, coworker that was not able to come to the webinar, I would highly encourage you to um, reach out to them and send them the link directly. John Bedford in Michigan asks, are there any tribal regulations? That's such a good question. To the best of my knowledge, there are no tribal regulations at this time. However, many of the tribes that um, have forestry operations as part of their tribal economy um, do move firewood across state lines. And so I am aware that tribes do enter into compliance agreements um, when necessary according to the needs of their business and their geography and so forth. So while I don't believe there are any regulations on the movement of firewood into tribal land, um, first of all, I could be wrong. And second of all, tribes are definitely in concept, um, and of course each tribe is different, aware of different regulations. Okay, another question is, is there a repository on the web where these regs are kept track? No. The best way to look them up, as far as I know, is to go to the Don't Move Firewood map, but that is not a repository of regulations. It is a summary of what the public needs to know when they're making decisions, and that's a really, really important difference. We do not um, we being Don't Move Firewood, we do not try to track industry needs. We try to reach out for outreach. Um, there, uh, Charles from North Dakota is adding that all the state quarantines are on National Plant Board, but unfortunately, you know, he's being specific that all the state quarantines are on the National Plant Board because all the federal quarantines are not. Federal quarantines are held by USDA AFES. 
And then in terms of actual um, personal firewood, things like those national park regulations and the state park regulations, those are not held anywhere as a central repository. Those types of regulations that really matter to um, the public when they make a choice about like going camping, the best place to find summaries of those is our state-by-state -state map. And the state-by-state -state map is held at don'tmovefirewood.org slash map. We try to make that um, as simple to use as possible. And um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar, that map is updated to the very best of our abilities once a year. We're currently rehauling it, um, adding all of the Canadian provinces today and tomorrow with all of their specific um, pest needs and regulations. And hopefully within in the next few weeks, uh, we will be able to um, promote the 2018 accuracy of the map and send it out to all of our different stakeholders to fact check. I actually got a couple really helpful facts on this webinar um, in the chat box from people. For instance, the reminder on Baltimore Delgid and some other things. Um, it's very difficult to get all of these different uh, pieces of information coherently summarized on that map. Uh, and then I did have just an, a reminder about that Kansas-Missouri border question that there's a restriction on the movement of firewood from known EAB emerald ash borer infested counties in Kansas. Um, so uh, obviously make sure that you are very aware of the different parts of Kansas that you are moving firewood. And um, like I said, Missouri has several different regulations regarding firewood and emerald ash borer and southern kinkers disease. So um, that's really going to be a uh, important regulatory environment to pay attention to. Thank you everyone for being on this webinar. I really appreciate um, high attendance. If you could please email me your name and your agency simply for keeping track of where you are from and who listened in to this important webinar. I use it for reporting out on my grant. That's really it. I won't ever bother you. Um, I really appreciate it. My email is on the bottom left corner. And um, I will be posting this publicly, hopefully within 24 hours or less. 